reactive training systems. Thanks for being here. This is obviously a coaching skills webinar. We wanted to do something to kind of, kind of make, make this month special. RTS has been around for 15 years now, and it's obviously been such a big part of my life and, and our lives. And yeah, I wanted to do something to kind of commemorate it a, a little bit. So that's why all the things that we're doing this month are in fact this month. And uh, this webinar is one of those things we're kind of discussing what we might want to do, like what, what might a good topic for what there be. And we keep coming back to coaching skills. I mean, look, we love coaching tactics. Every conversation we have turns to coaching tactics and whatnot, but there's a big component of getting better at sport, especially a sport like powerlifting, the component of developing athletes that goes beyond the tactical considerations. Uh, so that's kind of what led us down the road of wanting to do a coaching skills webinar. And so we obviously you can't cover everything as it relates to coaching skills. So we've got a couple big, broad topics. Uh, Ross has a presentation for you guys. John has a presentation for you guys. We're going to do some Q and a stuff. We're going to cover a lot of practical, useful stuff for developing athletes. And also like for, it'll be useful for you and your own training too. Like pretty much everyone involved in the sport of powerlifting still lifts to some degree or another. And so even if you're consider yourself primarily a coach, hopefully it's useful in your own training as well. So Ross, uh, Ross is going to be up first. I don't think we need to delay any further to you. I don't think so. We can get started. Cool. So Ross is going to be up first. He's going to be talking to you guys about the uh, components of coaching. And if you don't know uh, who Ross is, Ross has been a coach at RTS for quite a few years now. He's been involved in RTS training, like first as an athlete, then later as a coach, then as a full-time coach, uh, he'd been a power lifter, uh, for a lot of years. I think you've been power lifter longer than I have, Ross. Uh, Possibly. You know, come back in the, in the memory banks here, but Ross just competed at USAPL, uh, nationals where he did fantastic. I'm not sure if he's going to go into what some of that experience was like or not. Uh, you may have seen him on our IG stuff, uh, completing a epic grinder squat, one of the best I've ever seen, uh, which still has to feel good inside when you see that video. Um, Definitely. But more to the coaching end of things, Ross is a fantastic coach. Uh, he really uh, does a lot of work with athletes when it comes to uh, technical development for athletes and when it comes to mental preparation for sport, uh, which is, you know, part of what we'll be talking about today. So anyway, I don't want to take any more of your time, Russ. I'll let you kind of take over from here. All right. Sounds good. So as we get started, if any of you have questions, by all means, please go ahead, post them up in the Q&A, post them up in the chat. John and Mike will be tracking those. So when we do get to the Q&A, we'll be sure to circle back on those and touch on those as well. So just in case, so you don't forget about them. As Mike said, I am Ross Lepola. I've been lifting for a very long time since I was 12. I'm 39 now, about to turn 40. I've been competing for a very long time as well. I did my first powerlifting competition in 1999. So over 20 years of competing, not continuously. There are some years in there where there's breaks. I originally went to college for engineering and transferred and switched over to coaching full time in 2017 for Mike. I started coaching powerlifting in 2010. And part of what created that transition was as I started coaching, I really realized how important coaching had been in my life and how much value it added to my life compared to engineering. I didn't quite get the same value add out of the pursuit of engineering as I do out of the pursuit of coaching. And so a lot of the components of coaching that I look at are infused in that. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share some of this stuff with you and share some of my perspective with you on what I view coaching as and is and how we can use that in powerlifting to help people towards their goals. 
So in today's lesson, a couple of obje objectives we're going to go through is I first have a confession for you that I want to share. Then we're going to define what coaching really is. We're going to look at the roles of a coach. I'm going to talk about the RTS core tenets of coaching. We're going to touch on a few coaching styles that could go all over the place because there's a lot of different styles. I'm just going to touch on a couple of four core coaching styles. And then I want to share with you a couple of applications from real experiences from, from my coaching tenure and how different components of like the RTS core tenants played into successfully navigating some of those times. One of the quotes I wanted to share with you all today is from John Wooden. A good coach can change a game. A great coach can change a life. For those of you that don't know who John Wooden is, he is a very successful NCAA basketball coach. He won 10 championships out of 10 years with UCLA. That is, needless to say, impressive. And that hits huge to me. Why does that matter? Because I look at this at the end of the day is we are people first and athletes second. So we have to remember that we're dealing with people who are also athletes. And that brings me to my confession. I don't consider myself a coach. There's a lot of times I consider myself very different from a coach. Why is that? Because when we look at the core definitions, the core definition of a coach is a person who instructs or trains to perform that sport or a team. So the, the role of a coach, the base role of that coach is to teach somebody the rules and performance of a sport whether it be an individual sport or a team sport. And I do a lot more than that. And I pride myself on that. So that's where a lot of times I don't consider myself a coach. I consider myself a coach and a mentor at the same time. And the definition of a mentor is an experienced and trusted advisor. That's important. There are so many more things that we have the opportunity to do that are beyond helping people learn the sport of powerlifting or learn the rules or read the rule book or improve their efficiency in a squat. Coaching gives us that relationship opportunity to build with a person, to be able to support them in so many different ways in so many different areas. And I think about that because the most impactful people in my life outside of my parents have been coaches in my life. And specifically those coaches that went above and beyond to be a mentor, to provide conversations that supported my life and not just conversations that supported my sport. And that's one of the things that really adds a ton of value to my life as a coach is being able to step into this mentor role in addition to the coach's role. And the way I look at it is you have these different things, right? You have your coach teaches the sport, it trains the sport, it trains the skill to be better at the sport. And it trains the strategy about the sport. It, he, she, the coach. And we have this ability to kind of move back and forth in between these different roles. Yes, there's times when we need to focus in on the skill sport. And there's also other times where we need to maybe step into our mentor role where we can connect with the person who is also the athlete. We as a mentor can then also understand what the person seeks to gain. There are so many more things that we can as powerlifters gain from the pursuit of strength than just a PR. There's a ton of different things. There's a lot of life, life lessons we can learn from the sport. And there's also then a lot of life improvements that can transfer over to those sport abilities. So the ability to go back and forth between a coach and a mentor, I think is really beneficial and really powerful to this process. I also like to think about it as what is my intent of coaching? First and foremost, as a powerlifting coach, our intent has to be to improve performance. That's one of the core reasons why we all powerlift is we we're on the pursuit of five more pounds, five more pounds, five more pounds. So we have to be able to improve performance first and foremost. But I also want to create impact for that person, impact for their training, 
impact for them as a person, impact all around. And to be able to do that, I also then have to be able to inspire. And there's a lot of different ways that a person could go about inspiring somebody. But keeping that in mind, those are some of the core intents as I go through a coaching process and working with a person to keep in mind. Now, a few roles of the coach, and I wouldn't consider this necessarily an exhaustive list, an exhaustive list. There's a lot of different roles. So as I hit on some of these, uh, keep in mind, like you don't have to be confined to this list. You can pick and choose from this list that allows you to be the best version of yourself in your coaching role as possible. Now, obviously we need to step in the role of improving sport performance and skills and skills relevant to the pursuit of strength in powerlifting. One of those big things is being able to analyze and look at the data. What data supports what training choices are we making? How does this data inform the ability to write training? Or what context do we need to gather that supports the analysis of that data? Data alone is incomplete. We also have to be aware of the context, and that's where being able to connect with this person through like a role of a mentor is really beneficial because that is how we are able to extract the context of the situation. We need to be a resource provider. At the end of the day, while we also need to be a subject matter expert, we're not going to be able to sub be able to be a subject matter expert in every facet as it relates to powerlifting. I'm not a physical therapist. I'm not a doctor. So if I have an injured athlete, I need to be able to provide them resources and connect them with people that can better support them. If they hurt their shoulder, I, again, what am I going to do? I am not a physical therapist. So I need to be able to provide resources, whether it be connections with a physical therapist or another supporting cast, another supporting member who is a subject matter expert of that part, an aspect of powerlifting is important. So having access to those teams and different materials to help them is important. Know your strengths, know your weaknesses, stay your lane, know what you know. And if you don't know something, it's okay. We need to be learners as well. And not just learners for ourselves, but think about it as a learning facilitator. We are empowered through knowledge. Being a learner is the ability to gather that knowledge. Not only gathering that knowledge for ourselves, but using that knowledge to make smarter and better choices. Using that knowledge to help the lifter make better and smarter choices is really beneficial. So we have to consider ourselves a, a learner in the process as much as facilitating learning for the lifter along the way. We have to be an instructional specialist in whether we're on in an online setting or in person at a seminar, uh, coaching in person in general, we have to be able to articulate in a way that the lifter is going to understand how to improve the efficiency of their lift or what we need them to do differently about their breathing or their bracing elbow position, different things of that nature. But we have to be able to use words that will resonate with that lifter. We've all heard coaches throw cues out all over the top, all over the place. Some cues resonate with some lifters, some don't. So we have to be able to be a specialist in that regard and find the language that helps the lifter create the change that we're trying to seek to change. And that is where we're also that catalyst for growth and change. Helping that lifter evolve their technique so that it is as efficient as possible. It might not be the most technically proficient lift in the world, but it being as efficient as possible for that lifter. Again, the coach dropping into the role of mentor, uh, that's, a, that's a big one for me. So I got to list that here. That's when we're able to provide some of that life guidance. At the end of the day, again, we're people first and athletes second, especially in a hobbyist sport. We're not out here fighting for multi-million dollar contracts like in professional sports in the NFL and MLB and, and things of that nature. 
And what I mean by that to highlight is that in a hobby of sport, to me, the sport needs to be adding value to the lifter in ways that are likely beyond what a PR does. And that's when we're able to step into that role and help them connect with what's important to them. And that's one of the main reasons why I think that's important, why it matters. And again, think about what other roles you in your coaching do you fill and step into for your lifters? Because again, this is not an exhaustive list. There's a lot of different ways to go about this. And I, I, I wouldn't want any of you to walk away from today thinking that this is how you have to be. Th this is a lot of from me and how I like to approach it. So by all means, there there is more to this than what I'm able to pack into this one presentation. Hey, Ross. Yes, John. Uh, can you go back to the last slide? Sure can. So I have a question for you. You and Mike have worked together for a number of years, and you've had the pleasure of having several different coaches in a variety of sports and specifically powerlifting. Yep. Out of all of these roles, which ones have you found to be the most beneficial for you in your athletic journey? Oh, definitely the mentorship. Like I, I think about, you know, Mike wrote my training for how many years, Mike? Over five. And to this day, the most impactful thing that I can think of that has ever happened between Mike and I was the conversation that we had when I was struggling with to move from Alaska or not. And not only was that conversation impactful for me to help me arrive at a massive life-changing decision to move from Alaska and ended up landing here in Atlanta, Georgia, 5,000 miles later without, it was a major effort. So not only did that impact me in making that choice and arriving to that choice and being able to make that happen through action, the components of that conversation have really empowered me as well to be able to go forward and facilitate similar conversations with lifters that I work with now. So I, not only did it help me in my choice, it gave me tools and guidance to help other people who are also facing similar questions in their life of what should I do? This is a big choice that changes a lot of things. How do I arrive at an answer that I know is going to support me and be correct? Anything else, John? So it sounds like the mentor role was really impactful and being able to navigate that personal situation was an important thing that Mike was able to provide you, which is interesting to me because whenever we talk about powerlifting and coaching, we automatically think of sets and reps and movements, you know, and what yep. the program is. So that had nothing to do with the program. It had everything to do with helping you to guide life decisions. That's an interesting um, how did Mike's guidance there in the conversation around that major life change help you to see coaching differently with him? I, I definitely felt, I, I shouldn't say more cared for because I already felt really supported by Mike in so many different ways. You know, at that, at that point I had already transitioned to working for him full time. And he had been writing training for me for several years at that point and led me to lots of PRs and lots of great training and was always supportive when in the ebbs and flows of training. But it was, it was one of those conversations that you have with somebody that you're like, man, I really know this person's in my corner. W whatever comes up, like this is, this is one of those people that I know I can go to and particularly have a conversation with somebody and have them navigate the conversation to help me arrive at my answer for me without the projection of their life onto mine. And I think that is one of the critical differences in having conversations like that is helping the person arrive at what is best for them, not what we perceive as best for them because we don't know as coaches or mentors, what is best for them all the time. One of the things I hear is that this was a big win for the relationship 
between the two of you. Was there a leadership win there too? And did, did you get, did you have more buy-in with when it came to training and advice and things that Mike had mentioned after that? I can't say that I would have necessarily more buy-in to that because I was already pretty, you know, the, the trust was already well established. And the reason I brought it up is that I think sometimes when we have these conversations with athletes, it provides an opportunity to have some relationship wins. Yeah. And when we have those relationship wins, that can also help us in other times when we're faced with challenges in training and we make suggestions to our athletes or we provide other observations. Those observations can be more understood. Um, our frame of reference can be respected a bit more. Um, like I think of a time with a lifter that I had a similar conversation with. We went yeah. through the same sort of conversation. And on the other end of it, when it came time to think about training and some things that I was kind of pushing on a little bit, like, hey, you know, I see this thing. I think we might want to try this and that. He was much more open to it because there were some relationship wins that we had through that previous conversation. So that's kind of where I was with it was. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, it, we can, we're not therapists. That's not what we're here to right. do, but we are mentoring this person. We're having a relationship with them. And when we can have those relationship wins, those wins can carry over into other conversations that we have. So I just wanted to highlight the importance of that. Definitely. Definitely. It's very important. Cool. That you think we're, we're, we're complete. All right. So moving along. The RTS tenants of coaching, as maybe you might've been able to gather leadership, relationship, and creativity. One of the ways that I like to kind of conceptualize this idea is most things that require stability need to have somewhat of a like tripod or triangular base. We, we can't just rely on, on two different areas. Oh. Excuse me. So that's where I like to think about this idea and this concept is that when we have this tripod of leadership relationship and creativity it creates a good stable foundation of working with somebody so that we can navigate forward towards the thing that matters for that person leadership is just you know leading and guiding the athlete in here in this setting the pursuit of strength and we have to be able to do so with the ebb and flow of the display of that strength it's not all going to be gains we're going to have to be able to lead the lifter through the valleys when they come up unfortunately it's not all you know linear progress for the, our lives uh, if that were the case i'd be squatting a thousand pounds by now and well i'm not so here we are there's the relationship aspect and the way to look at this is that it's the connection between two people. And when we build a strong relationship with a person that is going to embody trust and that trust creates buy-in. It allows for the flow of information and communication between the two people with greater ease. We need to, especially in this online setting, need to be able to communicate really well with our lifters to, as John's going to go over, like extract the useful information extract the information that provides context to the data analysis data analysis alone is not enough we need to be able to understand what's going on with the human with the data creativity we typically look at as being like complex problem solving and mostly training related variables but it can also be in other ways in other areas we can provide creative solutions to problems through that leadership and relationship. They all kind of flow and have support to one another. And again, that's why we tend to look at this as the core tenants and that tripod is because there's so much connectedness between these three core tenants that help and support a coach to guide the lifter to get the most out of their training.
Now, again, there's a lot of different places that coaching styles can go. And I want to cover four that are fairly common. There's the dominant style, the steady style, the influencing style, and the conscientiousness style. Conscientious style. Understanding your style is important. You're going to have a base operating style based on who you are. And that's okay. There's no right or wrong style. And, but the thing is, is that knowing what your style and how you tend to operate is going to help you understand how to support the lifter along the way. So what are some of the details of those styles? When we look at the dominant style, the dominant style is very direct, decisive, and results focused. They're highly directive in terms of like instructions and details of instructions and uh, the, the direction that they're pointing a person and what to do. They guide the athlete with very clear and concise instructions along the way. Excuse me. Athletes who fit well with this style are going to be those that require high technical instruction, but have low relationship needs. Every lifter is going to be a little bit different in what they need. And that's where the fit of the coaching style can come in handy. This style is going to work well with novice athletes and athletes learning something new. Typically, somebody learning something new needs a lot more instruction and needs clear, concise instruction than somebody who's been doing it for 10, 20, 30 years. I don't need much instructional help in my squat technique. I've been doing it for lots of years. So a, a, do, a dominant style coach in that regards, providing me lots of technical direction, that's not a need of mine that I, that would be met. This style works well for expressing vital information that needs to be given urgently. Information also always comes with a importance factor and an importance level. Not all information is important. Some information we need to give urgently and this style fits well. When we need to make decisive decisions, and action is needed right away, this style works well in that regard. Think about it as uh, game day coaching. When we're handling a lifter, we need to be able to make decisive decisions. What is the next attempt that we're going to put in? You have 60 seconds. We have to be able to step into that role sometimes. The steady style is a little bit different. I like to think of the steady style as working a little bit more for team sports because there is a lot more like team focus in the steady style they're they're a bit more patient there's a lot more two-way communication but again that's where this style can come in handy in an online setting is that we have to be able to communicate with the lifter to understand the context and how that impacts the data analysis listening well is important we have to be able to ask questions in certain ways over just providing direction the steady style is really well at encouraging athletes to have an active role in the development. Some athletes have more needs than others in terms of having a say in what they're doing and how they're doing it. The steady style is also a bit more emotionally supportive. It, any coach can provide that technical direction and the steady style can do that. However, there's a bit more of an emotional support level with that steady style approach. So athletes who require technical instruction and relationship needs fit well into this coaching style. And it works well with athletes who are in that emotional support need. And it can be really good for lifters who desire collaborative efforts. The influencing style is a very extroverted, talkative, energetic type of coach. That's where personality has a play into this. Not everybody is going to be high on the extroverted scale. That doesn't mean you have to be. Again, none of these styles are, you know, the end all be all. So if you don't fit in one, don't worry about that. That's not the point of knowing what these different styles are. It's a matter of being aware of where, where your strengths and weaknesses are and capitalizing on those. The influencing style is like really energetically encouraging and interactive in terms of motivating the athlete. 
in a situation like this, the athlete will fit well when they have a low instructional need, but high relationship needs. It works well with athletes who display high levels of skill, but need more support and encouragement from probably like the mental aspect of things and the emotional aspect of things. It sits well, influencing style as well in those moments where you need a burst of energy. The, the pep talks and halftime speeches are the big one. Or if a lifter maybe missed their opening attempt, they need a, a burst of supportive energy in that moment. That's where this influencing style can bode strongly. There is a, a, a skill, the high skill to boost a low morale moment within that influencing style. The conscientious style is prepared, follows the rules, process driven. It's very structured around planning and structured around the environment that it creates. The athlete in a situation like that, as an example, will get lots of tools and instructions. It'll be excessive, not necessarily excessive, but it'll be abundant in those regards as far as the instructions to execute the training with minimal coach intervention, right? You send your new athlete a, a packet 30 pages long of how to execute the training so that you don't have to continue to tell them. The conscientious style coach is going to have a very well-organized system around things like that. That bodes well with athletes who require low technical instruction and low relationship needs. A, a self-sufficient athlete comes to mind. It also works well with athletes that are already technically sound and confident in their abilities. That's important. This style is really good at planning. Needs are high, like the, the ability to make plans and kind of stick to them is really important. And higher experience athletes with strong execution and emotional well-being fit well with this style of coaching. Now. One of the other reasons why I was kind of emphasizing that there's situations where each coach style bodes well in different moments is because I like to think about this a little bit differently. I tend to think about this almost more from a, a chameleon style. I want to be able to have the ability to adjust between the styles based on the fit of the moment for the athlete. What does the athlete need right now? For example, I tend to be baseline conscientious style. I have no problem stepping into an influencing style when a lifter misses a, a lift and misses an opener and they need that boost. They need that morale boost. They need that, that pump and that support. I'm ready. Let's go. Knowing what the different styles are, knowing how to ebb and flow between them and exercising the skill of being able to exercise, be able to flow in between them it empowers you to support different athletes who have different needs based on the different situations that arise. And that's why I like to think about it as this chameleon approach. I'm, I'm not, none of us are in a fixed place where you get put into this box of this type of coach and this style of coach, and you can't move outside of that box. Now, those confines do not exist in reality. They only exist in a limited thought or limited belief. So again, just to highlight the idea of being able to have some ebb and flow between the different styles, we'll all have our base operating procedures that are kind of like our default. And that's great. That's fine. Understanding where that is, is important and understanding how can we step out of that style to step into a different style when that's required. Maybe the athlete needs a lot more specific, direct, clear, concise action. I need to step into that dominant style and provide that direction. So there's a couple of real life kind of scenarios and examples that I want to touch on from a powerlifting perspective. Scenario one, an online client of yours is not getting the rate of gain that you think 
they should be achieving. So you go through a creative problem solving exercise. You adjust the program variable several times, different RPE ranges, different percentages, different protocols, ramping, benchmarking. You go through all these different creative style approaches in the programming. And you come to the realization that it's not necessarily the way you're writing the programming. You realize that there's a misapplication of the training. So what do you do in a moment like that? Well, I think first, we have to, as leaders, we have to own it. We have to own the coaching process. So if a lifter of ours is continually misapplying the training, let's say you're benchmarking at a buy by one at eight and they're consistently at a buy one at eight and a half, nine. So they're constantly fatigued and not able to generate momentum in the block. I need to own that as the coach. If I own that as a coach, I'm going to be able to provide better direction. And what I mean by that in this online setting is I need to be able to guide them to applying what I'm writing correctly. I need to provide them with the information and knowledge needed so that they consistently can consistently apply the training correctly rather than misapplying it. Misapplication is my fault. I need to empower the education. I need to empower the athlete with knowledge and education so that they can apply it the way I'm wanting them to apply it. When we think about it with the relationship lens and we are connected with that person, we can then also have the conversation of promoting athlete ownership because there is also that component. At the end of the day, they are the one who is choosing the load on the bar. We're not there with them. We can't choose 100 or 102.5. All we can do is choose to educate them on how to arrive at the correct number for the correct number of reps. And this is also where John's presentation will come in handy is we need to be able to extract useful information from that relationship to, to help guide them to making correct choices. Now, the other component that can happen to this that is also important for extracting the useful information is there's all kinds of life interferences that can come up that can disrupt training that would impact the same thing. And what I mean is if a, if a client is not getting the results you think they should, what other interferences are occurring? I got to have an amazing conversation a couple of weekends ago at USAPL Raw Nationals with one of Mark Robb's lifters. And a conversation that this lifter had with Mark was very much along these lines. He wasn't achieving at a rate that Mark believed he was capable of achieving. And they had this conversation about all these different things that was on this lifter's plate. Come to find out this lifter was really overextending themselves in a lot of different places in volunteer organizations and leadership roles in these volunteer organizations. And literally the day he decided to step back from some of those roles and positions, Boom, E1 or M starts climbing back up and this lifter hit some amazing PRs at Raw Nationals. So life interferences matter and we're able to have those conversations when we have the relationship that opens the door to having those types of conversations. Scenario number two, the lifter you are handling is on the verge of bombing out of a meet. They missed their first two bench presses due to their butt coming up and they're getting ready to go out for their third attempt. What do you do? How do you respond? From a creativity lens, you might consider how can we adjust this lifter's position in a way that will help keep their butt down, right? It, maybe, maybe their setup is a little bit soft and we need to create a little bit more tension in their setup. We have to be able to look for some of those things and some of those cues to, to problem solve some of that from a creative lens. As a leader, I think it's important that we guide them towards the outcome we're trying to get. And to me, that means guiding them towards a well-executed lift with thoughts that indicate a well-executed lift, meaning we don't talk about the problem. We don't talk about what's wrong. We talk about the things that we do to do it right. Language matters, and that can have a huge difference on the direction and outcome of things when we talk about what we want rather than what we're trying to avoid. So keep that in mind. Always talk about what you want to do. What you want to do is way more important than what you don't want to do. 
And the relationship comes in handy here because you can leverage what you know about the lifter to speak to them in ways that really resonate with them. I think it's really important when we go into particularly like meat day that we have some conversations with the lifter of what they need from a meat day handler so that we can talk to them and support them in the ways that fit for that person. And having a relationship with that person allows us to really leverage what to do with that. I don't want a pep rally. I don't want a coach up in my face. Yeah, you can do it, man. You're really strong. You can do it. Yeah, no, get go away. Get, you're fired. <laughs> like, I, I don't want that. I'm very internal and I need to be in me focused on my process and my execution. So I need space. Being mindful of that is important. It's important for a lifter to know that. It's important for a coach to be able to connect with that lifter to find out what they need in that moment. And that's honestly where a lot of this idea of a chameleon style coach came in for me was through working with Matt Gary. And Matt Gary often talks about your day as a meat day handler, your, your primary role as a meat day handler is to be what the athlete needs you to be. And that is the most, that is the most effective way to be a really good game day coach is to be what the athlete needs. So we have to be able to leverage those relationship components to be able to do that. Scenario three, this one's a little bit personal because it sucks. I hate this story, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. Your lifter just has a successful, successfully finished their third attempt deadlift. The number you called for as the coach, upon completion of that lift, you see that you made an error. That error is the lifter you thought the number you were putting in was going to give that lifter third place at a prestigious competition. Let's say ipf worlds for example and then upon completion of that lift you see on the scoreboard that they didn't go into third they were fourth because you read the scoreboard wrong i made this error and i'll i'll never read the scoreboard wrong again All right so what do you do leadership you have to own everything you have to own your mistakes you're going to make them it's going to happen in your tenure if you coach long enough you will make mistakes we have to own them. Owning that mistake and that error for me meant I was completely demoralized. I was gutted. I felt absolutely awful. But in owning that, it allowed me to grow and develop, to be better at reading the scoreboard, to be better at leading and guiding in those moments, to make smarter choices. If I would have denied that error, I would have denied the opportunity for that growth. And then when we think about it from a relationship lens, having strong relationships with that particular lifter or, or anybody allows us to navigate those moments with way more grace and humility. We make mistakes like that. I mean, that's grounds for dismissal. That's grounds to being fired. And the way I look at this and view this is the relationship that that lifter and I had developed over the course of two or three years solidified our ability to navigate that conversation in a way that allowed us to remain connected. And I still work with that lifter to this day. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity for him giving me grace in a moment of error. And again, it's the relationship and the strength of that relationship that allows for the withstanding of mistakes. Now, it is important again, to emphasize owning that mistake outright that nobody made that call but me i made that mistake completely and again owning it is the opportunity to grow and improve so that you don't repeat mistakes that's what's most important is that we if we do make mistakes we learn how to not repeat them in the future at the end of the day when we look at leadership, relationship, creativity. I like to think about it as skill development. What's important about that is all skills are developable, developable, meaning wherever you're at, whatever level you're at in that skill, you can do things to increase the level of that skill. And when we increase the level of those skills, 
we're going to increase our ability and our capacity as a coach and as a mentor to be impactful to the people we're working with. And when I think about leadership, I think ownership, ownership, uh, on a, on a radical level, every single time in the past several years of my life where I've connected with this idea of leadership as ownership and I'm struggling with something and I ask myself, what am I denying? What am I not owning? I almost instantly arrive at the answer of what I'm not owning and taking ownership of that aspect or facet is the thing that changes the direction to move it in a positive direction or, and, or move it in a direction that can create resolution if there's resolution needed. So leadership is ownership. Relationship is connection. We have to be able to connect with the person who is also an athlete. When we're connected with the person, we can get so much more accomplished together. So always think about it from a day-to-day -day basis, or maybe not necessarily day-to-day, -day, but just, just think about it. Like, what can you do that cultivates those skills and traits? There's a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different resources. There's not necessarily one right way or one wrong way that is the end-all, be-all method. But be aware of that and what you can do to cultivate those skills and traits today because they will help you be a more impactful coach to the people that you work with. Excuse me. So we went over coaching definition, mentor definition as well. The role of a coach, the RTS core tenants, leadership, relationship, creativity, we went over a few different coaching styles, dominant style, influencing style, steady style, and conscientious style. And we also talked about a couple of real life applications of coaching scenarios for you. And now we're going to turn it over to John Garofano as he talks about extracting useful information and providing guidance to the lifter. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share some of my stories and some of my experience with you. I, I really enjoyed being able to give this presentation today. Awesome. Thank you, Ross. Can you all hear me okay? All yes, right. sir. All right. I am going to pull up my presentation. Okay. Everybody see the presentation okay? All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is John Garifano. I am a coach here at Reactive Training Systems. I have been with RTS since 2018. I started as a part-time coach and became full-time in 2019. I oversee the coaching operation as well as the operations department, and I love my position. I love working with athletes. I have competed in powerlifting and bodybuilding. Um, the thing I enjoy the most about coaching athletes is helping them to work toward self-actualization, whatever that is, work toward the things that drive them, that get them up to get under the bar in every training session to find whatever goal that is. And what I'm hoping that you can get out of this presentation today is how to better understand all the information that's out there that you need to know to make the right decision for you and your athlete. There's a lot to know. There's a lot of information all around you. And so what I'm hoping that we can have some conversation about today is how to extract all that information, to put it into your system, to make the best decisions that you can. So I want to start off with this quote. I started thinking if we were to summarize what the primary or one of the most important focuses of our job is as coaches or as a self-coached athlete, if you're self-coached out there, it's to focus on understanding the athlete and their needs. But to achieve this, we have to understand the individual and we have to assist them in being able to understand themselves. So if you think about that for a moment, the core of our mission is to comprehend the unique needs of every individual athlete because they have all unique needs. Every athlete is an individual. 
They have their own aspirations, challenges, capabilities. Our commitment to them is beyond the surface level understanding, beyond the sets and the reps. It's to understand the psyche of that athlete, having a holistic comprehension of their physical, mental, and emotional dimensions so that we can communicate with them in a way that aspires change. We need to understand the vision that they have for their athletic pursuit. So we have to start there and we have to understand it. We have to understand their strengths, their weaknesses, their intrinsic motivation. Like I said, what gets them up every morning to hit the gym or, you know, get under the bar again. This involves a personalized exploration of their athletic journey. We need our training methods and our benchmarks to match their goals, not the other way around. And we have to understand the athlete's identity because it's the foundation of our awareness for how to drive change in their coaching. Now, as I say those things, it's not just up to us as coaches to understand that. We also have to empower the athlete to understand those things too. So part of our job is to help an athlete move through self-discovery. I believe that true optimization of coaching and partnership, and I love that word partnership, emerges when we can help the athlete understand themselves better. We want to tailor resources, guidance, our tools in helping the athlete to uncover their journey and what they need. And so what I'd like to do today in this presentation is talk about how you can do that. What are some of the tools that are out there that you could use in your coaching to uncover all of those layers? The one thing that I want to come back to is that our mission, again, it, it transcends the conventional approaches of here's your program, go execute. We're here to get into the nuance. That's what we're here for. The nuance of what's important to the athlete, what are their unique needs, and extracting all the information that we need to guide them to get there. So. Here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how to understand those individual athlete needs. And we're going to talk about data because no presentation from RTS would be complete without a conversation about data. I mean, Mike Desher is on the call after all. So we're going to talk about data and we're going to talk about communication strategies too, because it's more than just the data. The data is important but what you do with it and how you communicate it matters quite a bit. And I'm going to talk about motivational interviewing. It's an area of intense focus and importance to me. It's an area that I have education on and more than the education, it's something that I live and breathe and believe in. So I'm going to talk about that because it's a tool and it's more than actually a tool. It's a way of thinking. And then I want to talk about how we can provide feedback to our athletes. As we've gathered data, as we've understand how an athlete communicates, we think through the tools that we can use to communicate with them. And then we start thinking about the essence of our communication, how we can then take that and package it into providing feedback for an athlete. One thing I want to stop and say after hearing Ross's presentation today is you're going to see plenty of opportunities where the things that Ross covered earlier carries over into my presentation. And I'll try to highlight some of that and I'll try to come back to it. And Ross, if you see any connection points at any point in time, I invite you to jump in and reference your presentation as well. So let's start off here. And actually, even before we get to the slide, I just want to say that if you have a question at any time, feel free to put that in the chat. Feel free to put those in the questions. We are going to be copying down any questions during the presentation and there'll be a, there'll be ample time 
after the presentation is done for us to be answering questions from both Ross's presentation and mine, as well as any other questions that come up for you, even if they're not related specifically to the two presentations, but you just had a thought that popped in your mind and you want it answered. We're also going to be taking the questions and the comments that you provide today. And we're going to be using those in future marketing efforts that we have and YouTube content and maybe podcasts. So please feel free to include any of that because we love to hear your feedback. Okay. So let's talk about athlete needs. So whenever we take on a new athlete, we have to consider their, tra their previous training history. And this can include sports that they've done before, recreational activities that they're involved in now, and what their experience is specifically in powerlifting. And this is kind of a no-brainer. This makes sense. But how often do we overlook these things as coaches when we take on new athletes? You know, sometimes I've forgotten to ask, hey, did you play sports in high school? That's an important component. There are lessons that an athlete, le uh, an athlete learns when they are doing those sports that could be very beneficial for you in your coaching. And the same goes if you're self-coached to be thinking about your previous training history and the things that you've done prior to powerlifting. So for example, I mentioned that I did bodybuilding. So you know what? No one has to worry about me taking something pretty close to fail stick with it because that's, that's bodybuilding. Um, that is a physical characteristic that that is a trait that I have developed when it comes to a lot of the peripheral stress with my training. I can do that. I can tolerate it very well. That's information that you can gather simply by taking stock of an athlete's prior training history. We also have to find out an athlete's prior injuries. It's important, even if it's something that is in the past, not necessarily chronic, maybe they had an acute injury at some point in time, because we want to be aware of potential holes in the game and things that could influence an athlete's training. We need to be mindful of stress. A lot of this is self-explanatory and things that we probably are already doing, but it's worth mentioning that when you take on a new athlete, it's good to ask the question. I know that I do. I didn't always, but I, I ask these questions now. Tell me a bit about your previous sports history and any training. Tell me a bit about your injuries, anything about those injuries and how long did it take? Did you see a professional Ross making sure that you're referring out from time to time? Um, those are things that we need to take stock of. And then strength limiters. So when I think about strength limiters, one of the things that I think about is skill. That's an area that I think as powerlifting coaches, we're very familiar with. And as self-coached athletes out there, we're always aware of what are skill deficiencies? What are things in our skill that we can improve? How should we be engaging leg drive on bench? Or what should our back look like? Or what cue should we use on the deadlift so that our back is in this position? Those are things that I think we're already thinking about most of the time. But there's more than that, like hypertrophy. Does this athlete or do I, as a self-coached athlete, need more hypertrophy in specific muscle groups? How trained are my energy systems. So like if I do a hard set of five, am I taking 30 minutes to recover from that before I do my next set? Right? So those are things that we need to be aware of that quite honestly, when we grab a powerlifting program off the internet, we're not always assessing that. We're not assessing how long we're taking between rest breaks. And these can be holes in the game that could be strength limiters. We want to be thinking about these things. We have to extract that information. We need to know that. We also need to consider beyond the physical, the mental and emotional needs that an athlete has. How an athlete handles stress and adversity is incredibly important. Perfect example of that is an athlete who misses an attempt at an important meet. What happens? Now, I handled Newton Chang at... USA Powerlifting, Raw Nationals, and I'm sure he would be fine with me mentioning this. In fact, I'm sure he'll say it on an upcoming podcast at some point. But when he had missed an attempt, I was so amazed and shocked and glad to see the way he shifted his mindset and the way that he handled that adversity. It showed maturity. It showed taking ownership and looking at opportunity areas to be able to 
continue to have a good meet. And the end of the story is he ended up winning his class and being raw nationals. But in the moment, if he had faced adversity in a different way, it may not have gone the same way for him. It is important to understand how an athlete manages stress. So how do they handle a missed attempt at a meet? How does the athlete prepare for competition? I have seen plenty of athletes perform so well leading up to competition. And then the night before or two days before, they're not sleeping, they're not eating enough, and they come in and they're just not ready for the competition. And I hate to use this term, but kind of blown it right at the last second because they weren't managing the stress lead up in competition. So how does an athlete handle stress and adversity? How do they handle the anxiety of preparing for a meet? How do they deal with the anxiety of working up to a heavy single in training? All that information is important for us to be thinking about because there are creative solutions that we can use to write training, to address those needs. There are things that we can do from a leadership and relationship standpoint, going back to the tenets of coaching that Ross brought up earlier, that we can do to help athletes in those moments. And we need to extract that information to be able to use the tools needed to help the athlete to get to where they need to get. And lifestyle factors are incredibly important. Nutrition. This is one of those things that's kind of a no-brainer. We need to know an athlete's nutrition, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to be actively managing the athlete's macros or writing their diet or any of those sort of things. But a general sense of how the athlete is eating, where is their weight, are they consuming enough protein a day, those sort of things are important because they can influence the outcomes of training. Sleep. You know, we talk about sleep ad nauseum. I'm not going to talk about it too much other than to say that it's an important component. There's controllables when it comes to sleep and there's things that aren't within an athlete's control. Like I have a newborn. There are certain things that are not within my control, like when I'm waking up. But you know what? I can control when I try to go to sleep, how long I try to sleep, whether I nap, the quality of my sleep, when I consume caffeine. All those lifestyle factors are within my control. And it takes some self-awareness on my part to know what I need to change. And then there's balancing training with life. Look, Ross had talked about this earlier. None of us here are probably professional athletes where we have people cooking for us and we have, you know, physical therapists that can call that can treat a little niggle in training. And we're not having these multi-million dollar a year um, contracts. So we do this as a hobby for a lot of us. We do this as something that is very important to us, but we also have to balance out normal life as well. We need to get that information from the athlete on how they balance life. Does the athlete travel a lot for work? One of the clients that I had an opportunity to talk to at nationals that won his class travels about 60% of the time for his training. And so 60% of his training sessions are constantly on the road, training on new equipment, not necessarily, you know, your calibrated plates and calibrated bars and your combo rack. And he's training in less than optimal situations. So how does he balance all of that out with training? That's information that as a coach, if you gather it, you can find tools and tactics, but you don't know it unless you ask it. And how does the athlete prevent burnout? How do they rest and relax? What strategies do they use outside of lifting weights? Because all that stuff is important to know. And continuing with sort of athlete needs, what do we need to know in terms of their goals and motivation? We have to understand the goals and the motivation of our athletes. We need to know that goals can change over time. So someone's goal today may be totally different than it is a year from now or two years from now. And we need to consider that an athlete can have short-term goals and long-term goals. And sometimes those can be at odds with one another. So I had a junior athlete that I was working with who his goal was to compete internationally as a junior. And as he met that goal and wanted to continue on that goal, his long-term goal was also to do this for, for the foreseeable future, for the rest of his life. And then we were looking at his meet schedule and one year he had six meets on the schedule. 
And we talked about that, what it would look like to be able to peak for six meets, you know, short term, maybe that pushes his on the envelope in junior because it was the last year of his juniors, but does it in some way burn him out so that he can't stay in the sport of powerlifting? So sometimes those things are at odds with one another. And that's why it's important to know both so that you can navigate those things and have those conversations as a coach or even thinking about it as a self-coached athlete. And then how do all those goals align with your personal goals? So for example, do you have personal goals with your family, with your friends? Do you have other things outside of lifting that are important to you? And then where does lifting fit in for that? And is there a way to do both? Is there a way to be both, like I think for myself, to be a great husband and father, but also push my athletic journey as far as I can take it? And how do I do both of those things without necessarily destroying in some way the alignment of those things in importance in my life? How can I make them to be in alignment with one another? And we also have to think about when we're working with athletes that everybody communicates differently. Ross talked earlier about how athletes need different leadership styles and our goal is to be a chameleon. Communication preferences are an important thing. So not every athlete that you take on is going to be a good fit for online coaching. It's just the truth. There are going to be athletes that probably would be better suited to work with someone physically in person. And part of that is understanding that. Now there's creative approaches that you could take to that. So if you have an athlete that tends to really heavily be on that relationship side, maybe there are things that you could do like weekly meetings with them or periodic meetings or setting up those schedules. But does the athlete prefer like live conversation and do they thrive in that environment? Or do you have those athletes that maybe are low on the relationship end that would do just fine with asynchronous sort of communication? Maybe you could be recording a video and send it, sending it to them, or maybe they're fill, filling out a survey or sending you an email. Understanding the athlete's communication preferences are really valuable. Some athletes prefer text. Some athletes prefer video. I have athletes that when they check in with me, they are providing a five minute loom video talking about their training for the week. And it's easier for them to express themselves and the nuances of what they experienced in training. And for them, that's a low effort solution to the problem of conversation with a coach that may not necessarily be on your time zone or available to you 24 hours a day. To them, that's a great solution. Whereas other athletes would prefer to be thoughtful and, uh, and write out a, a text uh, via email to be able to write out a nice long email. They can review their words. They can make sure that it's comprehensive and send it. At the end of the day, if we're a chameleon with our leadership style, we can accommodate both of those, but we need to extract that information. We need to find that out so that we can be a chameleon in those environments. And then keep in mind that no two athletes are the same. Some athletes need a very direct approach at coaching where others, that would be really difficult for them and their emotional needs and the relationship. You have to assess how to speak to your athletes and which type of leadership style would be best in certain moments and understand that that may change based on the environment. Ross brought up the example earlier. You know what? On the day of a meet, come time for putting in a third attempt on squat. I want someone who is going to maybe ask me RPE and put in the number because you have a minute to put that number in after your attempt and to, there isn't necessarily all that time to deliberate, to have lots of conversation around it. So just kind of keep in mind that communication styles will vary based on the individual and the environment. So I want to talk a little bit more about communication. So let's talk a little bit about the data collection techniques that are needed when we think about um, collecting data and then communicating with our athletes. So when we think about collecting data, most athletes do not struggle with this first one especially in powerlifting, the quantitative, the numbers. We have all kinds of performance metrics. We've got rep testing, E1RMs. We've got meet day. We've got forecasts for 
made attempts and missed attempts and dot scores, IPF. I mean, we have all the formulas out the wazoo. There's tons of quantitative data for performance. They're all really important and we need to consider all of that. We have to gather that information. And that could be looking at the athlete's velocity profiles, looking at their video, looking at estimated 1RM charts. If you use our free training log as part of the RTS uh, website, our free training log provides performance data. It provides you estimated 1RM based on your performance. That stuff is very important. And having a training log. Now, whether you're using Google Sheets or Excel or you're writing it on a document and sending it over, or you're using our training log that's free and can be, you know, run block reviews and all those other things. Having a training log is important for reviewing the athlete's quantitative data. How are they performing? Are they getting better? And what works the best for them? But the quantitative data would be incomplete without the qualitative data. Qualitatively, we need to know the athlete's subjective experience or else the quanti quantitative data doesn't mean anything. So for example, if an athlete has a two count pause squat and it's showing that it's being really beneficial for them, but they hate doing it so much so that they skip it during their training, should we, re should we really use the two count pause squat in their development blocks? Or maybe sh we should replace it with something else. Maybe there's another movement that they would prefer that they're willing to do more often that performs just as well. We need to consider the athlete's subjective experience while they're training. We need to get that information so that we can write training that best suits the athlete. We need to be thinking about mood, energy, and fatigue. And one of the things that I also think about is training enjoyment. Mike has said several times that training enjoyment is probably one of the most underrated metrics, if you want to call it that. And we likely don't ask it enough. An athlete that is enjoying their training, that is willing to show up and work hard every day, is an athlete that's likely making progress. And we should consider the athlete's preferences in training. Now, Technology is an awesome thing for us as coaches, especially today. I think back to when I started coaching in 2008, nine, and I start when I first started writing training for someone for bodybuilding and it was all text-based stuff. We have so many more tools at our disposal now. So for example, we can pause and slow down videos. We can do bar path analysis. We can look at individualized velocity profiles. We have all these tools to help athletes to make better decisions. And video, velocity, all those things are tools. You know, all of them help us to get better at rating RPE and getting better at understanding ourselves and how we adapt to training variables. So all of that is information that you can gather that's data to help you to make really good decisions. Check-ins are another component here. So when we talked about qualitative, the check-ins provide the opportunity to get that qualitative feedback from your athletes. So whether you do that daily, I know some coaches that do daily coaching, get daily feedback from their athletes. Some do weekly, some do monthly. You need a system that helps you to regularly touch base with your athlete. Or if you're self-coached, to regularly touch base with yourself in some organized way. Some of the best self-coached athletes have a system for organizing whether things are moving in the right direction. And you have to have a system. There also has to be a way for you to gather periodic feedback. Now, if you're a coach, you have to get that feedback from your athletes. How, what is your training enjoyment? What things are you struggling with? Okay, we just finished this block. What do you think worked well? What didn't work well? What do we want to try? There has to be a way to gather feedback. This all comes down to data. It's qualitative, but it also can become quantitative as you run block reviews and you look at all those things and you look for the trends. Like I said, you want to marry these together, qualitative and quantitative data. We don't want to lean too heavily on anything. We want to mix it together because they all provide a more high resolution picture 
of what we're looking at for the athlete. So I want to bring this now to communication. All of the data that we're gathering, all of the information that we're getting from someone's training log, their estimated 1RM, their velocity profiles, their videos, the feedback that they provide, all of that is important. But we have to be thinking about how we communicate with our athletes once we have that information and we're trying to write training and we're trying to communicate the importance of that training or get buy-in. So I have a couple of things that I want to cover when it comes to communication today. I want to talk about active listening. Active listening is understanding an athlete's concerns. And it's not just hearing what the athlete is telling you. It's hearing the things that they're not saying. If you do live meetings with your athlete, whether, whether that's in person or over, you know, video conferencing, you want to be looking at their body language. You want to be looking at their eye contact. You want to gather as much information as possible. Coaches who practice active listening make a deliberate effort to engage with their athletes during conversations. You demonstrate empathy. You give respect to the athlete's experiences. And then you use reflective listening, which is simply put, reflecting back what you're hearing. So what I'm hearing is that the two count pause squat feels off to you because when you get in the hole, you find that you're drifting forward under your toes and it doesn't feel like a regular squat. That gives the athlete the opportunity to reflect back and say, yes, that's exactly what I'm experiencing or no, it has nothing to do with that. I actually feel like I'm better with my bar path. The problem is, is that I just generate a lot of fatigue when I do two count pause squats. Oh, okay. Now that's an opportunity to clarify for you that you understand what the athlete's saying, but it's also an opportunity for the athlete to clarify as well. Reflective listening ensures clarity. It makes sure that we're understanding the athlete's perspective, they're understanding ours. It creates an environment that is conducive to the relationship and the relationship growing. It builds trust, which you already heard from Ross, is one of the core tenets of coaching. Empathy is an important component as well. Being able to understand and understand the athlete's feelings and how they feel about something, in my opinion, is one of the areas that I have had to work the most on because I'm really good at writing the sets and the reps. I'm really telling, I'm really good at telling somebody to work hard. Understanding how they feel about something is an area that I've had to work on because it's very easy to just write the training and to send it to someone and to encourage them to work hard, but it's really hard work to understand how they feel about it and how they feel about their training. Like we talked about earlier, can get at their commitment and how much they're going to be sustainably able to continue training. It demonstrates that you care. It demonstrates that you have concern for them and their goals. For example, if you have an athlete that's not gaining at the rate that they want, or if an athlete gets hurt, I, I have an example that comes to mind recently where I have an athlete that is preparing for a meet and he got hurt. And we had a conversation and I said to him, it's okay to feel frustrated because you're experiencing pain right now. Anyone would feel the way that you feel in preparation for a meet in the next six weeks. What that did was it validated the athlete's emotion. And then from there, I chose to share a similar experience where a week out from a meet, I ended up hurting my back and I shared that experience. I ended up competing. It went very well, but I was able to share that story and that showed empathy for the athlete in their situation and how they felt. It was a relationship win. And from that relationship, when I was then able to give feedback with higher buy-in. Open-ended questions are another powerful communication tool. And really what it comes down to is asking questions that an athlete is not going to necessarily say yes or no to. So I can ask the question, do you like two count pause squats? 
And the answer that I'm going to get is typically a yes or a no. It's a binary answer. But if I ask, tell me what's the most successful or most challenging part of a two count pause squat for you, I'm going to get a lot more detail. Tell me why experiencing pain six weeks out from this meet is so impactful to you. What I'm going to get at from that is the athlete's emotions and their feelings. I'm going to get at their goals. I'm going to get, get at why this is important to them. So open-ended questions gives us the valuable insights that we need in the athlete's mental state, their training experiences, and areas where they might need additional support. And adaptability. From a communication perspective, we need to be able to be adaptable going back to Ross's chameleon analogy. We need to be that chameleon when it comes time for our communication. But at the same time, we need to be genuine. So what I mean by that is we are uniquely ourselves and we should not necessarily try to be someone different. For example, I'm not going to be the coach in the back, across the back and, you know, doing stuff like that. I mean, that's all Ross is getting. No, I'm joking. Um, you know, the, that's just not me as a coach. I'm also not going to be one of those coaches where you come to me for training and I'm just going to bark orders at you and tell you what to do. That's not who I am. Now I can be very decisive. I can say, this is the number that I want to put in. We are going to repeat that attempt or we're going to do this. I can do those things if the moment requires it or if the athlete requires it, but it is not my natural bend and it is not the area that I set up camp and live. So we need to be genuine about that because we are going to attract the right type of athletes for us that will thrive within our system. I like something to add to that too, John, because that bodes well with the chameleon style approach that I talk about and being able to bend between different styles of coaching. There is also a point at which you bend and break. And what I mean by that is if you have core values intact, let, let's just take the, the slapping, for example, and one of your core values is to not hit people, uh, even, even if it's okay for the other person, like if, if that's a core value of yours, don't break it. If that means that you're not compatible with that lifter, well, then you're not compatible with that lifter. There are other lifters to work with. There are lots of lifters to work with. And I think when we prioritize the person and the person's journey in the sport of powerlifting, we can understand that not every coach is going to be the right fit for the lifter. And that doesn't mean that the lifter is a bad lifter. It doesn't mean that the coach is a bad coach. It just means that they're not the right fit. They don't, they're not going to work well together and that's okay. Don't sacrifice your core values. Be flexible, be able to adapt, but also, as you say, John, be genuine in your approach because at the end of the day, whether people realize it or not, we, we all can sense when people are not being truthful and honest and genuine. And if you're operating in a place that's not truthful and honest and genuine, that will erode trust. And then that will undermine the relationship and it will lead to, you know, the eventual erosion of it all. So just wanted to throw that out there. Completely agree. And I think you're illustrating the balance that is needed here to be adaptable but also be you and be genuine and truthful and have integrity to who you are, your brand. I think that's an important component here, Ross. And it is easy to get caught up in, oh, this athlete needs this. I'm going to do this thing. And what we have to ask ourselves, is that kind of who we are? Or would they be best be served working with a different coach? At the same time, you know what? I'll tell a quick story that I think helps illustrate this. So I had an athlete that I was working with for a brief period of time and I traveled to go handle them. Now I had never met this athlete in person. We had talked online. I had coached them and I got there the day of the meet and I said, Hey, how would you like me to be today in handling you? What sort of things help you to perform the best? And the athlete said, uh, you know, I'm honestly not sure. I said, well, do you want me to hype you up? Do you want me to, you know, 
you know, say things loudly and talk loudly? Do you want to be involved in decision making? How, what sort of things do you think would be helpful here? And the athlete said, please don't like shout or try to build me up and those sort of things, because that's going to distract me from my process. Similar to what you had said, Roster, in your presentation. And the athlete said, that's, it's, if anything, going to give me more anxiety because I'm already dealing with a lot of anxiety for the meet and I have to actively calm myself down. And so I said, okay, great. And so that day when it came time after an attempt or before an attempt, it was, Hey, what RPE would you rate that at? I'm thinking we head to this. How do you feel about that? Okay. Number goes in and there was no extra hype. And at the end of the event, the athlete hit a bunch of PRs, was really helpful, oh, really happy with their performance. And they said to me that the most helpful thing that I did wasn't picking the numbers. It was being exactly what they needed from me and not making them something that they were not. And I think that that ultimately describes, I think, what you're saying here, Ross. So I want to talk about motivational interviewing for a moment, because it is a tool that you can use to do all of this, but it's more than a tool. It's kind of a way of thinking. And rather than giving you a set of first, you do this, then you do that sort of instructions. I'd like to just talk about what the essence of motivational interviewing is. Motivational interviewing is a, a system that was designed to help someone to become empowered toward change. So it's not changing someone, it's helping them to be empowered toward change. It's a play on words, but it's an important one. When we talk about helping others, it's important to remember that true help isn't something that's done to someone, it's something that's done for and with someone. This means that it takes time to understand their needs, their desires, working together to find a solution that works for them. Now, when we approach helping others this way, we embody this sense of collaboration and partnership with the athlete, and it can be very empowering to them. Athletes that I've worked with for years, when we sit down and we write training together, it's one of my favorite things to do, to have that collaborative co-coaching experience where it's sitting down and talking about, hey, hey, what do you think your squat needs? Here's my observations. Here's your observations. What do you think we should choose? And we have that level of conversation. To me, there's almost nothing better. And the buy-in is high. Leadership, you know, from a leadership standpoint, I have tons of buy-in. The relationship gets a win. And then from a creative problem-solving perspective, we often write training that is better than what the athlete could have wrote or I could have wrote individually because I have all that information together. But to me, that's what motivational interviewing is. It's no longer a matter of like one person being the helper and the other person being helpless, it values both parties' perspectives. Look, I coach, and I coach a lot of people, and I've coached a lot of people, and I have observations. That doesn't mean that I'm right 100% of the time. I'm going to be wrong. But I, I come to the table with those experiences, those knowledge, education. I come to the table with that. The athlete comes to the table with the education of themselves. And if we can partner together, the solution that we're going to provide will be significantly better than if we came at it individually. And what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about the spirit of motivational interviewing. Now, to really teach motivational interviewing, there are courses that go over how to do motivational interviewing, which obviously is beyond the scope of this presentation. But I want to leave you with the spirit of it, because if you can embody the spirit of it, You'll do the tools anyway, because it's just how you do things. I find myself doing it all the time. It's just how I do things without thinking, oh, I'm using this tool or I'm using this type of reflective response or I'm using these type of questions. I'm just doing it because it's what I do. It's who I am. So the first thing that you value is collaboration. And hopefully you're getting that from this presentation today is valuing the boots on the ground that the athlete's experience provides you as a coach. But that doesn't mean that the coach's perspective, kind of eyes in the sky looking down, isn't also important. It is. Just like the conversation where I talk to the athlete about, 
the junior who wanted to do six meets in a year. I said, hey, can I ask you a question? Are you concerned at all about the number of meets that you're doing this year and the risk of potential burnout? And the athlete said, honestly, no, but I'm open to dropping a few if I get there. And I thought that was a really good collaborative opportunity because if I came in and I was just like, hey, I don't think we should do this because I think you're going to burn out. I don't think that would have been as successful for that athlete, posing it as a question, allowing them to see my perspective and show the care and concern that I have, which is kind of the number four compassion, showing that I have compassion for them and them wanting to have a tenure in the sport of powerlifting. Like I'm one day to be an M5 powerlifter, like that would be really cool, but we're not going to be there. <laughs> um, and the athlete's not going to be there if they burn out in a year. So there's a collaborative opportunity there. and. If you can think about that, you'll just naturally do it. Now there's acceptance, which to me is just accepting that the athlete is going to choose that they are self-sovereign. They are going to choose what they want to do. And I have to accept that there are limitations and I do come to the table with observations, but I have to accept the fact that this is an individual who's going to make their own decisions. Now that could mean, Hey, listen, last week. Based on video review I've seen of yours and based on velocity profiles and prior loads, this to me looked like it was probably a nine RPE instead of an eight. My suggestion would be pulling some load off the bar so that we can, you know, sustain the effort through the block or potentially repeating the load, whatever. The athlete may still decide to go up and they might also be right about that by the way i may be wrong because their information is more timely more accurate in the session than my last week observation of their lift i have to accept that they're going to make decisions in the moment and some of those will be better decisions than i would have made because they're more timely and some of those decisions may not be the decisions that i would have made but they're all learning opportunities they're learning opportunities for me as a coach. They're learning opportunities for the athlete. So we need to collaborate and we also need to accept that the athlete is the ultimate decision maker in their training. Then there's evocation. And this is intentionally trying to get information out of the athlete, to ask those open-ended questions, to reflectively listen, to make sure that we're hearing all of this. So again, remember I, I mentioned the tools, the tools stem from the belief that the athlete is self-sovereign, that they are going to make their decisions and we are helping them. We are on a collaborative journey together and it's my role to ask the questions to evoke that kind of response, reaction and information gathering. And in all interactions, I need to show compassion. So what I mean by that is if an athlete misses an attempt, I need to be there with them through that and tell them that I'm, you know, I'm really sorry that they missed that attempt. I need to have compassion when they experience tough things in life that take them away from training or when they get hurt. I also need to have compassion for them in being self-sovereign and making decisions. And I also need to have compassion when they decide to leave my coaching or come back, take a pause, because again, it's not about me. It's about the athlete. And if we can have these four lenses, the, the spirit of motivational in interviewing, if we can have these four lenses in the way that we view coaching, we will do motivational interviewing. We will empower our athletes to make decisions, or I should say, we will have them to be empowered to make decisions. We will collaborate with them. We will accept them for where they're at and the decisions that they make. And we can evoke information from them. We can gather information from them that we couldn't possibly have gathered if we just went into the training log and looked at their performance. Because there's more to it than just the daily performance. And I want to leave you with some thoughts around providing feedback. So as a coach, we do have to give feedback. We have to provide feedback. That doesn't mean we just keep asking questions and let them, you know, come up with their own decisions all the time and are left kind of on their island, we need to actually provide expertise too. But we need to balance that expertise, positive and constructive. 
So if you have an athlete who their bar path goes forward on their toes on the squat and you want to provide that feedback, one of the things you could do is talk about some of the things that you're seeing that are going really well. Like, hey, I noticed that you did a really good job with your walkout. And I noticed that you were taking a really good breath in between each rep and rebracing. And I also noticed that your eye gaze was here and that was something you wanted to work on. You want to balance out that positive feedback as well as saying, you know, one of the things I noticed is that on this rep, you didn't hinge as much as you normally do. We need to balance out positive and constructive feedback. My guidance to you in providing feedback to your athletes is to be specific. So don't just say like, hey, you did a good job with your squat. What did I do a good job with? <laughs> what, you know, like if someone said you did a good job, well, what does that mean? I don't know what a good job is. Be specific, right? So you, you want to be specific. And it does show that you are compassionate. You're caring because you're paying attention. Paying attention to an athlete is one of the most important things that we can do in our job. We need to provide that feedback timely. So you have an athlete who competes and does really well and you message them a week later, that's way less impactful than messaging them, sending a text message immediately after the meet, like, hey, congratulations on that performance. You met this goal, this thing that you wanted to do. And you got to think about delivery. Sometimes email is not best. Sometimes you have to give feedback over a video call or a phone call, something that's live. And sometimes that's inconvenient with your timing. But delivery is really important. So you want to be specific, you want to think about timing, and you want to think about the way you deliver feedback. And you got to balance out positive and constructive feedback. And you want to have goal-oriented feedback, like going back to the squat example, like, hey, I know that this is the lift that you want to improve the most. And here are the, here are the reps out of this five rep sequence that you hit depth. That's awesome. Congratulations, you did that. Three out of the five reps in this set were to depth. And I know that's something you're actively working on. So for next week, let's try to get four out of five, you know, and you want to be specific with it. And you want to be focusing on goals. You want to ask questions to help the athlete to reflect, Hey, when you look at the squat and you look at your bar path, how do you feel about that? What sort of things do you think worked well? And what sort of things would you like to change? The other thing is growth versus a failure mindset. If you can help an athlete to think about how they're growing, when they're quote unquote making mistakes, it's not really making a mistake. It's a learning opportunity. Like, hey, you overshot the RPE by one point. Okay. You learned where your strength is in that individual session based on the fatigue and the performance that you had. What do you think that you could do next week? How could you make a decision in light of the decision you made in this session? That's awesome. You made it. You, you learned something because you're going to overshoot. We will all overshoot RPE. You know, even if you've been at this for two, three decades or more. And I think if you can help an athlete to think about a growth mindset, that helps them to see the positive things that are happening in training, the positive things that are going on and helping them to win the day. So you didn't hit a PR at this meet. And that's true. But what did you learn at this meet? What things did you get out of it? What things would you take from this meet and do again? That's why I'm really big on meet debriefs after a meet, jumping on a live call and talking about it. And the last thing that I want to leave you with when it comes to providing feedback is, I think it's important to view yourself as a consultant to an athlete and their strength journey. If we look at it that way, it's the athlete's decision. They own it. They're doing it. It's up to them to get under the bar. We are a consultant. Hey, when I see these things, this is what I would recommend. What are you sensing? What are you seeing? And ultimately they get to choose. I've had situations with athletes when we're writing training and I've said, Hey, I think that this would be a really good movement for that. And the athlete says, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Why? And they provide a rationale. Okay. Let's do that. Even if ultimately I was right and we end up coming back to that movement, that's not the point. I encourage self-exploration and awareness. I'm just a consultant and that's the limitation. That's where I stop. I am their consultant. And if you can do that, you can provide feedback in a way that I think 
is meaningful and respectful for the athlete. So in summary, we talked about how to understand an athlete's needs, some of the data collection things that we need to gather as we're gathering data to help guide our athletes. We talked about communication strategies, ways to get additional information that we wouldn't get just from looking at the data. We talked about the importance of motivational interviewing and how it's respectful, it guides people toward change, and how providing feedback and guidance can be really beneficial in all the information that we've gathered from the data, from the communication, from the way in which we embody motivational interviewing can help us to provide guidance and feedback to athletes. And how if we embody the consultancy model, we can actually be very effective with our athletes and respectful at the same time. So there, and I wanna thank everybody for coming to my presentation. I believe we're going to move into a Q&A session. Thank you for tuning into this replay of the Coaching Skills webinar. Now, if you found this presentation helpful, I'd like to invite you to consider taking our comprehensive course Beyond the Program Coaching Skills. Now, this isn't your typical course as it dives deeply into the art of coaching, more than just sets and reps. Now, our focus in this course is to those often overlooked soft skills that can truly make a difference. For example, can you foster buy-in? Do your lifters trust your judgment? And are you adept at extracting vital information to make informed decisions that genuinely align with the athlete's goals? Picture yourself mastering communication strategies that bring out the best in your athletes. This course is the culmination of years of experience. We cover the basics of coaching, how to build relationships with your athletes, leadership, including game day leadership, developing yourself as a coach, and how to bring it all together to leave a lasting impact on your lifter's journey. Beyond the Program Coaching Skills is a course that will help you to level up your coaching and unlock your athlete's potential. We look forward to seeing you there and thank you for watching this presentation. So we have a bunch of questions come in, guys, and I don't know if we'll be able to get to all of them, but we'll get to a bunch of them and of those that we can't get to today, we will follow you guys. At a um, one, let, let's go back to Ross has been. Uh, real quick, uh, one question that came in a couple times has to do with how much do you show of yourself, like your, I guess your true self to your athletes. Um, for example, Luca asks, uh, how much do you show your athletes how you feel if they ask you? Because if you're in the role of a mentor, you should always show that you have your stuff together, right? There were a few questions that were kind of worded similarly to that one. Right. There's definitely a couple of different places that something like that could go. I think ultimately a lot of it is really going to depend on your level of comfort with sharing your personal details of your life with a lifter. Personally, based on my experiences and the place that I've grown to, I find an incredible amount of value in being vulnerable with my lifter, with anybody that I'm, I'm trying to have a deeper connected relationship with in any capacity. And being human in that process and, and showing myself and showing where I'm at, if I'm sad about something or if I'm frustrated about something or something along those lines that is a little bit call it a lower, lower grade emotion. It's not always positive. There can be negative emotions. I will show that. I will be that with them. I don't hide myself. Now, I also realize that in that same lens, it is my responsibility in the leadership role that I don't allow that to overshadow and detract us from supporting that lifter and that person forward. A lot of times what I find when I am vulnerable and share something with that person is one, it strengthens our relationship. Two, it shows them that I'm not perfect because at the end of the day, none of us are. And what that does to me is it builds trust. When they can see where I'm at 
a lot of times we have an easier time moving forward together rather than them thinking that I'm up on this pedestal yelling down at them. Hey, come on up here. Come with me. We're up here. No, no, I'm, I'm going down to the valley in the bottom of that to get them and hike up the mountain with them. And being vulnerable and sharing myself with them to me is a way to go about doing that. And obviously the level and degree of that is going to vary based on the situation, the relationship with the lifter, the content of it. There are things that, yeah, there are, there are aspects of my life that I'm not going to be willing to share with lifters for certain reasons. And we have to be able to know and understand where our own boundaries are at with information like that, because at the end of the day, it's up to us to be able to know where that's it, where that line and be able to hold that line. Cool. Um, I just wanted to add a one or two quick things. Um, one of the things I would also add to that is self-disclosure is a tool and it's talked a lot about in motivational interviewing, but one of the things to consider about self-disclosure is answering these two questions. Why am I disclosing this information as a coach? Why am I disclosing it? And two, who's benefiting? And if the why is to benefit the athlete, and it's also the answer to the second question to benefit the athlete, you know, if I'm making a point, if I'm trying to illustrate an example and the athlete is the one benefiting from this, then it's completely appropriate in terms of, you know, sharing the information where it gets coach. If we start to kind of share things in an attempt for us to be gaining, um, and it's not necessarily the interest of the athlete that is number one that comes to mind. So that's something that I reflect on that I think about when I go to share something is like, is the athlete going to benefit from this? And if the answer is no, then probably should hold it. Yeah, yeah that's probably, a good point. That's a good heuristic uh, to filter to, uh, you know, keep the athlete in the center. Um, John, question came in during your presentation is how do you manage, uh, sorry, this one's from uh, Joe Kim. How do you manage athlete subjective experience for things that you can't find a different way to approach them? For example, they hate pause bench, but the athlete struggles uh, in competition with the keeping their pause to standard. So there's a couple of different ways to tackle that. And I would love for all of you guys to jump in as well, Mike and, and Ross, because I'm, I'm, I would love your experience here, but. How I would typically play this is ask the athlete, what about a pause bench seems to be something that you don't enjoy and start there and ask the question because it could be something like, well, I don't see progress on my pause bench. And then if you pull up block reviews, you might see that blocks that had pause bench in it are actually some of the best blocks that the athletes done because their competition lift moved. And when you looked at the lift, they actually got better. So that's where you can bring in your coach perspective and say, I definitely understand why you may not want pause bench being in the program. However, when I show you th this, it actually shows that you benefit from it. And maybe if we change expectation in our mindset around trying to progress pause bench, but instead think about transference to the competition lift, maybe we can have a different level of motivation with it. So sometimes asking that question can be really helpful. And what I just did there was a reframing. So that's the tool of reframing and you can reframe the experience a little bit once you have a little bit more information. So I suppose my first tactic would be ask an open-ended open question, gather more information. And then two, if it's something that I have some sort of data to object against, I might reframe the experience a little bit. The other thing is you may want to just not use the competition like you may not want to use an extended range of motion or an extended pause bench because the athlete may not want it. Maybe there's other tools. Maybe there's another type of bench, or maybe you find that, Hey, when the athlete does a ton of touch and go, it doesn't really matter when they get to competition because they're able to pause in the example you provided it. It wasn't so, but there might be a way where you just kind of go with it. We're not going to do pause bench. We're going to do these things instead. Yeah. I, I like that response, John. And, uh, just to add to that, I wouldn't fret about it too much because it does seem to be a fairly rare situation where 
the thing that the athlete really truly needs, and there's not much for an alternative, it seems to be rare that I come across athletes who are unwilling to do that uh, or, or don't get it to some degree that you can, it, maybe it's not your favorite, but you understand and you can, you know, you can get it. Uh, if not, then maybe this kind of touches for me, touches back to the comment about training satisfaction and, and that being an important metric. You might be dealing with somebody who's just not committed to that level of being a power lifter. And that's fine too. You know, if, if they're super serious about this, then those people tend to be willing to do what's needed. If they're not, you know, the, the most common instantiation of that, that I've come across is like, this training is boring. It's too much of too much monotony, you know? Those people, in my experience, tend to be a little bit less serious about the sport in general. And so that's probably fun. You know, like they don't need the most power liftery program possible. You know, we can give them something that's, uh, that's a little bit more to their liking. They can get enough of, they can still progress toward their goals while keeping training satisfaction high. You know, the, the other thing to add in here is there could be a leadership opportunity, like thinking back to Ross's presentation, maybe the athlete doesn't understand why the pause bench might be beneficial. Is that what you're going to say, Ross? Yeah, that was the lens I was going to go with it too. It's like, I, I think a lot of times to create buy-in from a leadership standpoint is guiding them to understand why. I'm having them do something in the first place, you know, Bulgarian split squats. I've never met a person that likes Bulgarian split squats, but I've, you don't count John, sorry. You're a bodybuilder, <laughs> but most people tend to loathe uh, Bulgarian split squats, but they tend to be really supportive in a lot of really good ways for, for lifters. So we need to be able to guide them to that thing that's beneficial. And a lot of times when they understand what the benefit is of something that isn't very fun, you increase the buy-in. The 530 tempo work is another one that I commonly see people don't love it. And when they understand why I'm asking them to do something, that is oftentimes when that buy-in is created. I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I get it. Yeah. A question. Yeah. So then you have come across a question similar to this a few times, but it has to do with uh, rating RPEs and uh, how that can be sometimes contextual. We've talked uh, a little more in, in recent years, like there's the standard RPE chart that at least on the upper end of the spectrum, uh, it's very tightly correlated with reps in reserve, you know, nine RPEs, one rep in reserve and so on. Uh, and we talk more lately about like, well, sometimes if you're about your single at eight RPE, you know, that may not be exactly two reps in reserve always. Uh, and same with the other end of the rep spectrum, if you're doing like a 20 reps, you know, an eight RPE might not be exactly two reps in reserve because things get kind of funny around those, those ranges and RPE itself can be used in a, in a more linguistic convey a meaning that isn't always just the mathematical facts of the, the set. Um, so how do you, the question is like, how do you approach that? How do you manage that for, for lifters even? Uh, and I mean, I think a lot of that comes back to communication as well. I would start with a classic RPE chart and any sort of deviation from that has to be clearly communicated. And if makes you uncomfortable in any kind of way or anything like that, that's fine. You could revert to, uh, reps in reserve as being kind of standard because there's less ambiguity around it and then layer in other things when your intent is somewhat different. Uh, you know, recently I've been using first rep velocity, mm -hmm. uh, when programming for my deadlift because it, the. RPE and reps in reserve has gotten a lot fuzzier for me 
and it's um it's a lot more subjective difficult to rate so i didn't love ambiguity so i, I started to bring in a different tool to manage the load at that point but um, when it comes to you know discussing any of this stuff with your clients i think clarity of communication is always going to be king there one of the things that i want to add to that mike that i think it makes the scale a lot more gray area but also helps me personally in clarity the thing to think about particularly coming from from theo's question if you look at a buy one at eight is a buy three at ten one of the things to be an aware one of the things to be aware of is the closer you get to a 10 the more perfect you have to be to hit a by one at 10 your technique has to be spotless you can't have any errors in that 10 in a true 10 you can't have those errors so the closer you get to that 10 the more compounding errors lead to misses and then you also have to consider that each athlete is going to have a a, a different skill set right some lifters have the ability to be okay while moving slow some lifters have poor work capacity or or poor conditioning so in in that regards a by three at nine if you're basing a by three at nine from your by one at eight that by three at nine might turn into a by three at ten a lot faster if you don't have good conditioning because you're winded you're breathing or that can be the case more on a by six at nine that's going to lead to that's going to increase your odds of making errors in in your technique that are not that you can't overcome at that range in that area does that hopefully that makes sense does that make sense to you guys <laughs> yeah i think the compounding errors thing is a is an important point absolutely you know when you're when you're going for a heavy single things have to be perfect your positioning has to be exactly where it needs to be to be able to be successful with that lift. The other consideration is that some athletes are not as trained with the ability to grind. That is something you can learn. That is something that is trainable. And when you are doing lots of sets of five or eight or whatever, those can look different, even if they're nine RPEs versus a single out of nine. And I think that that is another consideration from the creative problem solving lens is that you can get better at that skill and the ability to display force for a long period of time, maximal force, which would be like a one RM attempt is a trainable thing. Um, and if you spend all of your time doing very fast sets of eight, not necessarily training that quality. So thing to consider as well. There's another question I wanted to get to here. I think this is a really good question. Um, Beck asked, uh, how do we build relationships with online athletes who are essentially strangers? Encouraging athletes to have conversations outside of training can be challenging. So I was thinking it might be a good idea to get into some specific tactics as well. So I, I think there's the, the broader question and then the possibility for some specific tactics. Yeah, I think. That's definitely a really good question because it, it is more difficult in an online setting. You don't have the, the, the type of conversation you have with somebody is different, but at the end of the day, like what are some of the core components of building a relationship with a person in person, right? It's, it's having conversations with them. So that's our first place to start is having a conversation with them we like to start when we take on new lifters is have a video call a video conference with them and i like to approach that first conversation as the opportunity to start building the relationship and that means the content of that conversation isn't going to be about what sets and reps did you do before you came and signed up with me no i want to know about your goals because goals tell me what's important to you. And when I know what's important to you, then that can help me on how I'm going to support you in this role. And connecting on goals that are lifting related, uh, personal related, professional related, like what are the things that this person wants to seek to do and accomplish in their life? Not just on the platform, but outside of the platform, because those things 
will impact what we do from a coaching decision basis. What do they do for work? Uh, Mike worked with a ER doctor whose schedule was erratic and all over the place. That impacts training significantly. So we need to be able to take those things into consideration from a programming standpoint. And then we can also use those things to work into having and creating those conversations that are on a little bit more personal level to get to know each other, to have a personal relationship, to create that connection and bond with the person. It's really the same. It's just some of the mechanisms are the same, but obviously there's a, a little bit different flavor of it because it ends up being a video conversation compared to a, an in-person conversation. Yeah, I, I was going to say that it uh, can take a little while to develop the same level of closeness. It might not ever be exactly the same. You know, we talk about this when, we, when we're able to finally meet in person and handle them in competitions, that it's a really enriching. But even before that, there's things that you can do. You got to give it time. Um, the character of that relationship might stay a little bit professional to learn things about them the process of paying attention, you know, you'll learn you and like, we're also saying what's important to them. Um, you know, one of my clients uh, recently shared with me that, uh, he raises ducks and he sends me duck videos like, about every week now, you know, so, but I've been working for like a year before I knew that about him some time and, and for some people you get to that level, uh, and then other people you don't, um, even if you don't develop like, like a more personal relationship with them, there's still the coach athlete relationship. And that's the more important of the two, um, you know, kind of, it, it's the component relationship that fosters trust and supports the leadership. Oh, one other point to add in here and this is kind of on the business end of coaching a little bit um i think coaches i know i did early on confuse what my role was uh, often i thought my role was to write training and send a program and then i realized and mike you said this recently on your instagram about how our role is a service. I'm providing a service to this athlete. And if I thought about what that service was, the service is not just the program. It's more than that. It's a relationship. It's consultancy expertise, a person to come to talk to when an athlete has questions, it's guidance. It's the mentorship. It's all the things that Ross mentioned in his presentation, honestly, to sum it up, that's what I'm here to provide. And if I start out those conversations thinking about how do I provide that service, I can develop those relationships with an athlete in an online environment. Now, look, if you can get FaceTime with your athletes, I think that that's fantastic. And I wish I could get that with every one of my athletes, like truly being in person because you pick up on so many things. But next best thing is to have routine live meetings when you can. It's challenging. It takes time. It takes time to write training. It takes time to answer emails and questions, and it also takes time to have live meetings. But if you're thinking about what you're doing, which is to provide a service, connection, human to human connection, this thing that's important to them, I can't really see a way around it. All right, guys, let's do, uh, let's do one more question. We've got a bunch more, but we'll have to follow up with everyone, possibly offline or, or separately from this. This is a good question for us to wrap up on. Uh, Alex asks, if you could go back five years in your coaching career with one skill, attribute, or approach that you have now that you didn't possess then, uh, at least not to its current extent, what would it be? So five years put us in the 2018 time frame. You guys have one that comes to mind? First, and uh, I suppose it's slightly off theme uh, for, for this webinar, but the, the one thing I wish I had then got now is, uh, I would say a deeper understanding of load management, which has been able to solve problems with that tool. 
um, uh, you know, problems for my athletes, problems for myself. Um, just the ability to go deeper on load management, avoid getting, avoid setbacks, avoid getting injured, avoid, you know, downturns in strength. Um, you know, so much of this from a progress standpoint is staying healthy long enough to make it. And as I've gone on, you know, in my own lifting and in the lifting for my clients, um, it seems like kind of digging deeper into that process has been really important. So that would be, that would be my thing. I got one that I think is a little harder to try and pin down precisely. And that's why it was, it's taken a minute to formulate, but we really value at RTS, the collaborative process. We like to ask questions of our lifters to understand the context that fits in with the data analysis and try to get a, a more whole and complete picture. We believe that that is paramount to writing radically individualized training. You cannot write radically individualized training if you're only looking at sets and reps. Then you're just applying a system if you're doing that. So we need to be able to communicate with the lifter. And I would say like one of the big skills that I have to constantly work on in all honesty as well to, to continue to be in tune with that skill is the balancing act of listening to their context and their information, taking it into consideration while also not just wavering to what they say they want and need. Like there has to also be some conviction on my end of, yes, I agree with that or nope, I don't agree with that. We're not doing that. That's not a good idea. We cannot do that. And, and knowing where that line is can be tricky to navigate. And I think a lot of times we have to remind ourselves as well that we're in that leadership position. So when they're asking and wanting to do something that is silly, that we know is not going to be beneficial to, to their strength and, and their journey in powerlifting or, or their goals and what's important to them, we need to be able to pull them back over across that line and, and get them away from that. And in a collaborative process, that line can be difficult to hold because you do need their information. You do need their preferences, their likes, their dislikes, and to consider that. And at the same time, not just let them run off and, and you do everything that they say they want to do because that's, they're not always in that position to know. It's trying to narrow down the last, you know, five years worth of learnings and there's so much. I think if we're, if I'm keeping it on theme, thinking about coaching skills, the biggest piece for me is creating expectations with athletes around communication. For me, I've always found that the collaborative coaching experience was what I wanted to provide because it's what I like. It's what I want as an athlete. And so it makes sense that I would attract people that want that too. The challenge with that is making sure that communication standards are communicated. When are they expecting to get responses back from me? How often are they going to meet with me? How is training written? And making sure that that is incredibly clear. That has been a huge learning opportunity for me and one that I will continue to work on because as a coach, you also have to refresh your energy levels. You have to be able to not go into every day of coaching exhausted from the previous day. You have to still be able, I, I still have to be able to train hard. I still have to be able to do all the things that are important to me because doing those things create a value add to my coaching experience for my athletes. I see problems differently. I solve problems differently when I take my training seriously, when I'm providing enough room for that 
and setting healthy boundaries for myself as a coach and as an athlete to make sure that those things line up and that my athletes have clear expectations. And so that was one of the biggest things that I would say over the last five years that I've worked on. Can't say I had down, but I'm certainly further years ago. Those are both really good, really good insights, really important ones as well. And everyone, thanks in here. Thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for asking your questions, more questions. And uh, I want to fuck each of you, uh, whatever we can get to it. It might be a YouTube, it might be, uh, we'll, we'll get some answers. Um, again, thank you. You guys know how to reach out to us. I uh, hope to hear from you again soon and see you on the next one. Thanks y'all. Thanks everybody.